The 2001 Milwaukee Bucks came out of nowhere. Milwaukee hadn't seriously contended in over a decade, and they opened that season looking even worse than usual, hitting a 3-9 record around Thanksgiving 2000. Coach George Carl shredded his players, privately and in the press. He called them irresponsible millionaire crybabies. Soon thereafter, things turned for the better. Why? It wasn't because GM Ernie Grunfeld made some big midseason move. He'd already invested plenty of owner slash senator slash department store magnate Herb Cole's money to cement this core. It was just that these guys clicked. They figured it out. The 01 Bucks began with Glenn Big Dog Robinson. The Bucks' number one pick in 1994 weathered some tough seasons in Milwaukee, but led their turnaround season by scoring more than ever and by meeting Carl's challenge to play a more well-rounded game. Robinson had another rising all-star by his side. 25-year-old Ray Allen already ranked among the game's best shooters, with potential to become the next great NBA two-guard. Veteran point guard Sam Cassell set the table for Milwaukee's top scorers and had the championship experience to take his own big shots with confidence. Around their big three, Milwaukee had a sturdy, stalwart center in Irvin Johnson, they had a tantalizing young sixth man in Tim Thomas, and they had a fan favorite glue guy in Scott Williams, who brought additional championship experience from his days with the MJ Bulls. This guy will matter later on. This Buck squad didn't defend much, but as the 01 season progressed, they shared the ball and ripped nets from downtown, scoring more efficiently than even the starriest NBA offenses. The Bucks rode this wave of torrid, beautiful basketball into a first round win over the Orlando Magic. They survived a surprisingly close second round series against the Charlotte Hornets and reached the 2001 Eastern Conference Finals against league MVP Allen Iverson and his scrappy, battle-worn Philadelphia 76ers. With Iverson ailing, the Bucks stole a game in Philly, then pulled ahead two games to one at home. The Bucks, a franchise that hadn't won a playoff series since the 1980s that could have left Milwaukee if Herb Cole didn't save them, that made zero meaningful noise in the 90s, now stood two wins away from facing Kobe and Shaq in the 2001 NBA Finals. And then came a collapse, or really a nesting doll of multiple collapses. The 2001 Eastern Conference Finals remain quite controversial. We don't need to relitigate every bit of officiating angst, but we can agree that things fell apart for the Bucks, and refs were a part of that story. Milwaukee led 2-1 against a wrecked Sixers lineup. Iverson in particular carried an injury on basically every body part. But Philly took games 4 and 5. Iverson was available if not efficient. Dikembe Mutombo overwhelmed Irvin Johnson down low, and the clutch moments tipped toward Philly. In Game 4, it was Iverson fighting his way to the rim and the free throw line to hold off a late Bucks rally. At the end of Game 5, Philadelphia's Aaron McKee gifted Milwaukee two thick bricks at the free throw line, and then on defense he lost track of Glenn Robinson. But Big Dog whiffed his open game winner, and Ray Allen rimmed out this buzzer-beating tip. Three to two, Sixers. Then there's game six. On paper, it looks like a decisive momentum shift back toward the Bucks. Ray Allen went laser mode. Nine threes, 41 points, and a personal 17-0 run in the first half of a double-digit Bucks victory. But it wasn't so simple. Milwaukee had been simmering about calls all series. Robinson lit into the refs after getting ejected back in Game 4. Well, in the process of winning Game 6, the Bucks boiled over. 
They were mad that the Sixers nearly came back with a heap of Iverson free throws in the fourth quarter. They were mad that veteran forward Scott Williams got ejected for a flagrant foul, which then got him suspended for Game 7. So the Bucks entered their decisive game, missing their starting small forward and also real, real grumpy. Grumpy and loud enough in public that both Allen and Coach Carl drew fines for accusing the NBA of conspiring to put the super popular Iverson in the finals. In any event, without Williams, with Iverson finding an unshakable groove, with Matumbo bullying Johnson down low, and without much scoring outside their big three, Milwaukee went down pretty easy in Game 7. But don't let that conclusion eclipse a fantastic, surprising Bucks season. League best offense, rock solid core, and perhaps going forward an us against the world ethos to ensure coach and stars stayed on task. Well, let me start by saying one new player shouldn't ruin a good NBA team. It doesn't work that way. If that seems to be the case, then the team was probably fragile to begin with. Okay, so in the summer of 2001, GM Ernie Grunfeld did nothing significant until right before training camp, when he suddenly traded away the beloved Williams and a pick that became Josh Smith just to clear space for... Hello. Mere days before the season began, Milwaukee signed Anthony Mason to a multi-year deal. Grunfeld knew the super tough, super brash forward from his time with the hellacious 1990s Knicks. The GM knew what Mason brought, both as a dynamic player and, for better and worse, a bold locker room presence. Since leaving New York, Mason had dabbled as a prime offensive option in Charlotte and played one surprise all-star season in Miami. And now, here he was in Milwaukee turning 35, exhibiting the fitness level of, well, someone who had waited until late October to sign with the team. Mace played a healthy, statistically decent 01-02 season in Milwaukee, but swapping him in for Scott Williams shook that harmonious offense of the prior year. Coach Carl granted Mason team high minutes and an excess of ball handling responsibility. And, as was his tendency, Mace made some noise. On a team with a pre-established pecking order, Mace wanted the ball more, and said as much, without apology. He criticized the Bucks' practice habits. He was overheard insisting Carl bench one of his, quote, jump shooter teammates, somehow turning the Bucks' best feature into an epithet. But while Mason's disruption made him an easy scapegoat, there was plenty other shit going on. For one, the Bucks had injuries. Allen had never missed a game before 2001, but battled knee tendonitis all season. Robinson sat 16 games himself. Tim Thomas and Sam Cassell were both known to be playing hurt. And then there is Coach Carl. To the extent that Carl's vicious rhetoric motivated the Bucks' 2001 turnaround, it came off a lot worse while they plunged in 02. The Bucks had a solid enough record as the All-Star break approached, but after a loss to those Sixers, Carl fumed, labeling his stars stubborn and selfish, and proclaiming someone needed to be traded or fired, maybe himself. Carl kept snarling after the break. So much that Ray Allen's mom got concerned, and the Bucks kept losing into springtime. A five-game slide in early April, including a blowout loss to the awful Cleveland Cavaliers, dropped the Bucks to a stunning break-even record. Still, Milwaukee just needed one win in Game 82 to hold the playoff eight seed. But that night in Detroit, they got crushed by the new hot team in the Central Division. A year after they almost made the finals, the Bucks fell from first place in mid-March to out of playoff contention in April. Since the 16-team playoff format was introduced in 1983, 
No team had ever sunk that deep that fast. When you make that sort of history, you gotta shake things up. Glenn Robinson was the longest tenured member of Milwaukee's Big Three, present through bad times and good. But Big Dog, like several others, had bickered with Coach Carl, and his relationship with his co-star, Alan, wasn't great either. Robinson also entered that offseason embroiled in a grim domestic violence scandal. Late in the summer of 02, Grunfeld traded Robinson to the Atlanta Hawks, returning an older and inferior player, Tony Kukoc, plus an 03 draft pick. Carl approved of the chance to remake team chemistry and to dump Robinson's big contract. The Bucks now appeared to be Ray Allen's team. That went okay on the court. Trading Robinson certainly didn't make the Bucks better, but Allen proved a capable first option. And then, before the deadline of the 02-03 season, the middling Bucks stunned their fan base. They traded Ray Allen to Seattle, another member of their erstwhile big three. A young, electric, rising star was just gone. Why on earth would they do that? The coach, George Carl, said Allen was nothing but trouble. Allen said he grew to despise the coach, although later claimed it wasn't so much animosity as it was Carl's angst that the star was close with team owner Herb Cole. For what it's worth, Cole did have to approve the Allen deal, but he came to regret doing so while Ray enjoyed a long and brilliant career elsewhere. He admitted as much years later. And even in the moment, the trade sucked shit. Milwaukee gave up Allen, some other players, and a first round draft pick. From the Supersonics, they received Desmond Mason, who was a young, exciting dunk contest champ, but ultimately not that great. And they got Gary Payton, an established star, albeit a 34-year-old, playing on an expiring contract, and maybe still harboring a grudge against Carl from when he coached the Sonics. Oh, and Peyton was a true point guard, just like Sam Cassell. The Bucks traded their best player for a guy who played the same position as their next best player. Very weird. If the trade made any basketball sense, it was right here. Buried on Milwaukee's old conference final team was a diamond in the rough. Michael Redd had been a second round pick and played only garbage time as a rookie in 2001. But since then, Red had refashioned his skill set to become one of the NBA's best three-point shooters. The smooth lefty progressed from bench scorer to starter to, by 2003, a legitimate Ray Allen successor, the Bucks' next backcourt star. So fine, onward. A kind of lopsided new core led Milwaukee to basically the same record as the prior year. The Bucks snuck into the 2003 playoffs, and in round one, they kind of gave the New Jersey Nets a scare. A critical last second finish in game three, Rodney Rogers in the clutch, Peyton missing at the buzzer, went New Jersey's way. The Nets pulled it out in six. So, Bucks, you traded away your two best players to appease the coach. Your performance basically did not change. What do you do now? Step one, trade away the third guy, and Irvin Johnson too. This was just an awful deal. Upon being traded to the Minnesota Timberwolves, Sam Cassell immediately enjoyed an all-star resurgence. Milwaukee didn't get nearly enough in return for him. But maybe Ernie Grunfeld had something else up his sleeve. Oh. Days later, Grunfeld left to take the Washington Wizards job. Okie doke. Longtime Bucks employee Larry Harris got a promotion and in his first significant act as GM, watched Gary Payton walk away in free agency for nothing. Payton was the big name Milwaukee acquired for sacrificing Ray Allen and his whole Buck career was 28 games and a playoff defeat. Bummer, but now Harris had a clean slate. It would be his task to completely reinvent the team for Coach Carp. Oh. Okay, the coach who once insisted Milwaukee either trade the stars or fire him, got it both ways. After detonating their big three in a succession of poor trades, 
Milwaukee sent Carl packing too. If all of this seemed like the work of a distracted, confused franchise, well, that might be because Herb Cole was in talks to sell the Bucks to some other guy. The name rings a bell. That deal fell through, though. Cole retained ownership of a team well-positioned to zero out and rebuild. But here's the thing about Herb Cole. The quality that makes this collapse distinct. The man would not pull the plug. Call it pride, call it stubbornness, and don't forget that the team once did flirt with leaving Milwaukee, but Cole's franchise rejected the incentives to tank for the whole next decade, an era vacillating between mild promise and mild disappointment. It began in 2003-2004, just the third season after a near finals berth went fine. The Bucks got a hot young coach in Terry Porter, Red fully broke out as an all-star, Tim Thomas departed in a sort of lateral trade for Keith Van Horn and his large outfits. While Milwaukee hadn't lucked into any of the true 2003 draft prizes, they did enjoy the talents of rookie point guard TJ Ford. Ford looked awesome until a horrifying spinal injury ended his season and cost him all of the next one too. The shorthanded Bucks claimed an 4 playoff berth but ran into the eventual champs in the first round. Here began the cycle. Milwaukee felt they had enough to run it back in 05, but injuries hurt them and Porter got fired. The Bucks sunk to just 30 wins, that stinky gray area between playoff contention and prime lottery odds, the fate of non-tankers. But Milwaukee got super lucky that offseason. A scant 6% chance of winning the draft lottery paid off. With their unexpected number one pick, the Bucks selected Andrew Bogut, a very solid center, albeit not one of the superstar point guards who defined that draft. Milwaukee felt set at point guard with TJ Ford returning from injury. Bogut, Ford, a re-signed Michael Redd, and newly added Bobby Simmons made a nice core for new coach Terry Stotts. Back to the playoffs, where Milwaukee fell to the Pistons again, but hey, an uptick. And then a downturn. More moves, more injuries, another coach fired, another losing record, and this time some bad lottery luck. Milwaukee missed out on a tip-top draft pick and one of these guys, and since they already employed Bogut, passed on picking Joe Kim Noah to instead select E. John Leon, a dude who absolutely did not want to play in Milwaukee, battled injuries and inconsistency, and then left town after just one year. Yet again, a bad but not quite bad enough season, another missed opportunity to draft the best of the best in 2008, another disappointing lottery pick who didn't last in Milwaukee. And in the middle of that 08-09 season, Milwaukee lost its only all-star caliber player of this era. Michael Red tore up his knee in January 2009. Red would never again be the same player and departed Milwaukee a couple seasons later. Still, the Bucks did not empty out. The next few seasons sort of blur together. Milwaukee traded young guys for vets. They traded vets for vets. They spent pretty serious money to plug in one free agent after another, after another, after another. All the while, Milwaukee used a succession of mid-tier lottery picks to draft players who were fine but didn't fulfill their potential as bucks. In the process, they passed on a couple future big-time stars. This is a bland, featureless, consistently at or just below average era of bucks basketball. No stars, no home run draft picks, no playoff excitement except one little head fake of a run in 2010. At long last, 2013-2014 was rock bottom. Before that season, GM John Hammond used yet another middle of the draft selection on a mysterious youngster and acquired veterans who didn't make a difference plus one kind of nobody recent second rounder. Fans broadcast their exhaustion with a billboard. Winning takes balls. 
You need good lottery odds to draft the best players, and to secure good lottery odds, you need to stop patching holes and allow a tank to run its course. Well, Milwaukee didn't heed the call to tank on purpose, but the tank came for them just the same. Bad moves and bad luck combined to deliver the 2014 Bucks a franchise low 15 wins. Around the end of that season, 79 year old Herb Cole sold his franchise to some hedge fund, private equity, billionaire type guys. And then there were none. The abrupt collapse and demolition of this team gave way to long term rot, and at last, the sale in 2014. This low point comes with a couple opposing punchlines. Bottoming out didn't pay off. The Bucks got to pick second in 2014, but selected Jabari Parker, yet another player who failed to meet his potential and whose career fell short of players drafted beneath him. But all that muddling in the middle somehow did pay off. This 2014 roster, this dismal accidental 15 win flop included a future all-star in Chris Middleton and a future multi-MVP winner, finals MVP, and sure thing Hall of Famer, Giannis and Dedekumbo. Two key components of the 2021 NBA champions. What can we learn from the collapse of the Milwaukee Bucks? Well, some great teams are volatile and might incinerate at any second. They may burn for longer than fans want because lottery odds don't reward an owner's dogged refusal to slash costs and lose on purpose. But buried in the ashes, you just might find a diamond or two, or a whole ring's worth of diamonds. I don't know, man. Collapses can be really weird. Thank you so much for watching Collapse. We've got way, way more where that came from. All right, that's it. Goodbye.